Hello and welcome to our Exploring the Bible series. This is uh, series number four. And uh, in this series, we're looking at David's friends and foes. Uh, perhaps a little different than uh, that we've done in the, in the first three series. We're going to look at uh, a character study, really. And this is another way of exploring the Bible. Uh, God reveals to us many of his, uh, his important um, ideas and concepts and how he interacts with us uh, by, by recording in scripture, the events of, of, of people. And uh, so that's what we're going to look at uh, in this in this series. Uh, this is week one, and we're going to look, be looking at uh, Jonathan, perhaps one of the most famous uh, friends uh, in the Bible. And uh, if we were to subtitle this, it would be the positive influence of friends. And uh, probably the key takeaway is that uh, we need to have God at the center of our relationships. And uh, we'll, we'll finish up with that at the end of our presentation. Now, just before we uh, get into Jonathan specifically, uh, since this is the first class, we're going to have kind of an overview of, of what our purpose of this study is. We explore the Bible uh, in, in this way. Uh, and the idea is to use the example of David's life to examine the impact that others can have on our life, uh, for good or for bad. So we're not really, it's not really a character study of David, although obviously he's going to be the central figure. We're changing the lens or the perspective a little bit, and we're looking at the life of David through the eyes of those that he interacted with. And um, hopefully this will allow us to see things uh, different, uh, differently than we have in the past. And, and this is a good uh, Bible study technique. As we learn to read the Bible effectively, sometimes we just need to, to change the perspective, uh, to take what might be a familiar story, and certainly the life of David is perhaps the most famous uh, life in scripture um, outside of the life of Jesus Christ himself. Um, but we just maybe need to change the focus or change the perspective and we'll see some new things. Uh, we're going to learn that people and situations and circumstances do not happen randomly in the life of a believer. Uh, we know that David was a man after God's own heart. That doesn't mean he was perfect, far from it. Uh, but how did, how, did, how did he interact with those people? How, how did he, he interact with, uh, how did the circumstances of life mold him and develop him? Um, as an individual. And we're going to look at that both as those that had a positive influence on him and those that had a negative one. So for us, it might be a difficult coworker. Why is God allowing this to happen? Or, or that bully at school? You know, why, why is God uh, bringing this person into my life? Um, or in a family situation, perhaps the annoying sibling. These are all sent from God. Um, but likewise, the loving parent, or, or maybe the challenging parent, um, the compassionate stranger, the random person is like, where'd that person come from? Um, these are all uh, sent uh, from God uh, or God allows to happen for our character development. And as we're going to look at this one today, the friend who sticks closer than a brother. So let's get our Bibles open. Uh, it's something that we, we want to do as we explore the Bible is have it open in front of us. You may have a hard copy. Um, you may have um, it on a device. So let's turn up to 1 Samuel chapter 14. And like our previous series, uh, these slides will be available um, as PDFs, as will some extra notes, uh, including a Bible marking uh, sheet. So uh, reach out if you want a copy of those. They should be there on the, the site if you're watching this video. So in um, 1 Samuel 14, we get to learn about Jonathan. And um, we're not going to spend a lot of time here, but this is laying some groundwork. Uh, perhaps you're familiar with this, where um, Jonathan was the prince, as it were, the, the, a leader in, in Saul's army. His father, Saul, was the king of, of Israel at this time. And uh, they were um, under bondage, really, to the Philistines. And uh, we can see there that in verse 1, um, now it came to pass, this is First Samuel chapter 14, to get some context here, verse 1, it came to pass on a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to his armor bearer, uh, come, let us go over to the Philistines garrison that is on the other side. And he told not his father. Now, this is important. He's not trying to upstage his dad. He's not trying to call him out. He's a man of faith and action. Um, you know, he's, he's, he's later going to let David fight against Goliath. We, we wonder why he didn't. Well, he had a special relationship with his father, Jonathan did. And even when his father was not being faithful, Jonathan was careful not to upstage him in any way or, or you know, call him out. So he didn't tell his dad. He just wanted to do something to try and get the ball rolling, as it were. 
Uh, we'll come back to some, some details here, but really we want to see that, that Jonathan here was a man of faith and action. Uh, so we come to, to verse um, uh, 12. The men of garrison answered Jonathan his armor bearer and said, come up to us and we will show you a thing. Jonathan said unto his armor bearer, come up after me for the Lord hath delivered them into the hand of Israel. So it wasn't about him. Um, he, he wasn't, uh, you know, he wasn't focusing, oh, it's all about me. You know, he's delivered into my hand. No, into the hand of Israel. He, he's not looking for glory for himself. Now, did you, did you, did you read carefully um, previously <laughs> um, about this test, as it were? Have a look at it, because they're basically at the bottom of this hill, and the the, the, the Philistine garrison is at the top. And um, basically, uh, he says to his armor bearer, let's go. And, and his armor bearer trusted him. And he said in verse 7, do that is all in thy heart. And basically, he says, okay, let's go over there, and we'll we'll reveal ourselves to them. We'll kind of, you know, come out from hiding, as it were. And then um, verse 9, if they say to us, tarry until we come down to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up unto them. But if they say, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord hath delivered them into our hand, and this shall be a sign unto us. So he was allowing God to work. If if And if, uh, the, the most likely thing is for them to say, come up to us, because then, you know, they'd be coming up the hill, they'd be at a disadvantage and so on. The, the Philistines are not likely to go down to them. And so Jonathan um, sets up this test and lets God work and acts upon it. I've often wondered, what if they had said the other? What would they have done? Would they have waited for the Philistines to come down and then fight them there? Was, was Jonathan basically saying, Lord, you can deliver them, whether they're here, whether they're there, just give me a sign. Help me to know your will. Um, I think Jonathan was willing to fight either way. So he put his trust in God, but he was also willing to put himself on the line and, and put his faith into action. Now, really, the, the center of our... Uh, actually, I did want to notice one other thing. Notice uh, later on, and we won't go into the details of chapter 14, but later on in, in verse uh, 45, when Saul, his father, made us a ridiculous vow and, and was saying that Jonathan deserved to die, look what the people said. Verse 45 of, of 1 Samuel 14. Shall Jonathan die, who hath wrought this great salvation in Israel? By no means. As the Lord liveth, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground. For he hath wrought with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan that he did not die. So the people acknowledged he was a man of faith and that he worked with God, um, that he had wrought the salvation. Um, Jonathan wasn't putting himself forward. He was letting others speak on his behalf. And so there's a lot to learn from from uh, Saul, uh, from David uh, and his relationship to Saul, his his father um, in, in, this, in this situation. But our, our real um, purpose in this study is to look at the connection between Jonathan and David. Um, and we've got the quote here in, 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 on the screen, Proverbs 18, 24. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Let's see how this worked out in, in the life of, of David. If you go over to chapter 17, um, this is, of course, the story of David and Goliath, for which David is probably most famous. Um, but his, his brothers were there. And how did his oldest brother, Eliab, react to David coming uh, to, to the battle? Well, you can see it there in verse uh, 28. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spake unto the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why did you come thither? And with who hast thou left, left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know thy pride and the naughties of thy heart, for thou hast come down that thou, thou mightest see, see the battle. So his older brother was actually envious, angry, jealous, um, when he should have been encouraging David. David was willing to go and fight this Philistine. Um, and 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 uh, work on God's behalf, and his brother uh, didn't uh, didn't accept him at all, despised him. In fact, whereas you come over to, to chapter eighteen, verse one, we're going to spend a lot of time here. Um, that the, the the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David. So that's what we're going to explore today. What 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 was it about this this relationship that was that was so special? Now we don't know for sure um, what they looked like. Here we have a picture on the screen of, of uh, Jonathan giving over to David all his clothes, uh, anything that was representative of power, prestige, his his arm, his um, his sword, and his bow. Um, 
And we know at this time that, that Jonathan was a leader in Saul's army. So the, there's quite an age gap here. And John, uh, David was the youngest. He was not even really eligible to be in the army. Um, and, and Jonathan was, an, was uh, a leader of the army. So it's important to understand that they didn't bind together because they were peers. You know, in our society today, it's all about, uh, you know, your peer group and, and making sure our children stay with their peers and get good friends in their, in their peer group, which is true. But this is not a story of peer friendship. Uh, there's quite a gap here in their age. And that's going to be irrelevant to the, uh, the depth of the, of the love and friendship that they shared. Well, you've got your Bible open, hopefully now, to uh, chapter 18. This is, of course, after David has defeated um, Goliath. And you'll notice if you if we read carefully that in, in chapter 18, verse 1, it came to pass when he, this is David, when David had made an end of speaking unto Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. So, yeah, I'm sure jo Jonathan was impressed by David's, um, what he did when he, when he took down Goliath. But it's what he said that really impressed him. Jonathan's love of David is based on his faith, yes, demonstrated in the defeat of the giant, absolutely, but his speaking forth truth and his implicit trust in God. This is what bound them together. It was a, a, a common understanding of who God is and what God's able to do. And um, just going back to the uh, that, that incident with um, chapter 14, we, we read this verse, but let's, let's, let's revisit it. David and Jonathan shared a common faith. That's what bound them together. And, and that's going to be important for us to understand whether it's, you know, friendships uh, of, uh, you know, a friend that we have, um, a, a spouse or, or a, a partner, um, whether it's someone of the, of the same gender or a different gender, uh, whatever our relationship is, uh, you know, it's important for us to understand that our, our relationship, it might be between siblings, it might be between uh, parents and children, husband and wife, uh, just two good friends. Uh, the, the, the important thing is that they, they shared a common faith. This is what united them. This is, this is what bound them together. And it transcended any of those other things. I'm sure there was a, a lot of other things that they had, common, had in common, but it was their faith. And just have a look at this. Jonathan said to his armor bearer, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or few. It didn't matter that it was only Jonathan and his armor bearer compared to, you know, a garrison of, Fer of, of Philistines. That, that didn't matter to, to Jonathan. Doesn't Nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or for few, from few. And what he just heard David say, when, when David was trying to plead his case that he could go and fight this giant, David said to Saul, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. It was all about God and his ability to deliver, not the prowess of Jonathan or the, the skill of David. Uh, they didn't see it that way. They saw that God was, was working through them. And it's this that bound them together. After David had finished speaking, then the heart of Jonathan was bound to him. You know, seeing him in his, his defeat of Goliath, that's one thing. But if David had come over and said, ah, oh, look, I'm the best, you know, look, man, I just took down this giant. Um, you know, what are you going to do for me now, Saul? You're going to promote me? You're going to give me your daughter in marriage? You're going to do all these things? Jonathan might have been, hmm, not sure that's exactly the kind of guy I want to consider a friend. But it wasn't. It was all about this common understanding that anything they accomplished was through the work of God. And this is what bound them together. This is what true friendship was. Now, we want to, 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 to keep this focused on David's friends and foes for our future classes. We, we're trying to look at Jonathan. Jonathan is connecting to David because of David's faith. David isn't um, moving in, in this direction. He's not trying to get in favor with any of the king's relatives or anything like that. He's just doing his thing. So we're trying to focus on Jonathan. Now, have a look at this. We still got our Bibles open and uh into to, to first samuel 18 careful bible reading you know words are important so in verse one the the soul of jonathan was knit with the soul of david um basically jonathan just gave himself over uh we're going we're going to see that 
Look at verse 3. Jonathan David made a covenant. It's going to be the first of three covenants. Because he loved him, his own soul. And, and what does Jonathan do? Jonathan strips himself of the robe that was upon him, gave it to David and his garments, even to his sword, his bow, and his girdle. These were tokens of who he was as the prince, as the, the, the a captain in, in, in the army. He was giving them over to David. So David's basically giving, sorry, Jonathan's basically giving of himself. He's saying to David, I'm yours. Whatever you need, I'm, I'm here to help. What about Saul? Saul in verse 2, it says, Saul took David that day and would not let him go uh, to his father's house anymore. So you've got these two people who, who both love David. We'll see that. But what was the basis of their love? For, for Saul, it was all, take, take, take. You're mine, he says to David. You come with me. I'm taking you. And Jonathan's saying, whatever I have is yours. And he gives and gives and gives. So this is really a question we need to ask for ourselves. Uh, do we take friends into our life, into our friend group? Do we take them based on what we're going to get out of the relationship? I mean, what was in it for Saul? Well, there was some prestige. There was being connected with this man who had taken down Goliath. He, he wanted to be associated with this, this person who now had a, had a great reputation. We're going to see later that is when we look at Saul in our next class, we're going to see that's the beginning of their downfall because the relationship isn't based on anything of substance. Saul's just in, in it for himself. Or, or do we give ourselves freely to others? Do you give of yourself freely to others? Do you, do you look at and say, how can I help in this relationship? What can I do to give of myself to benefit this relationship? And, and that's really powerful uh, because one of these relationships is going to last and one of them is going to fall apart. And it all depends. If we're, if we're in it for ourselves, um, it's it's going to not end well. And, and it's really important to see that Jonathan was doing this with his eyes wide open. He, he knew what was going on. When he gave all those things, the, 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 the robe and the garments and the sword and the bow, when, when he was giving those to David, he understood the implications of that. So, so is our relationships in, in, in our life, are we, our role in those relationships are we being selfless or selfish? So just keep a finger there and flip back. You know, the, the things weren't done in a secret here. The Saul had lost the plot in the in the in the matter of the Amalekites. And Samuel had said to him that he was going to lose his kingdom. Have a look at this. We've got a couple of verses here on the screen. First Samuel 13. Um <clears throat> And, uh, and and verse 13, this is the situation um, where Saul didn't wait for Samuel. Samuel said to Saul, you have done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For thou, for now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. But now thy kingdom will not continue. The Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast kept not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. So Jonathan knew, Jonathan would have heard this. Saul would have known this, that someone else was coming. It's described here, a man after God's own heart. Now, perhaps Saul thought this with Jonathan. We've often wondered why Jonathan wouldn't have been the one that was chosen. Perhaps Jonathan thought it of, it, thought it of himself. But flip over the page. When he doesn't um, destroy the Amalekites as described, what does Samuel say to Saul on that occasion? Verse 50, uh, sorry, 28 of chapter 15. Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine, which is better than you. Saul not only lost the kingdom, kingship for himself, he lost the dynasty. It was not going to go through him. There was going to be no glory in this for Saul. Now just think about that from Jonathan's perspective. Jonathan had nothing wrong. It was his father, and yet he was going to lose out on being the next king because of what his father had done. And he was okay with it because Jonathan was focused not on himself, but was on what was on best for what was going to be best for others, and in particular, what was going to be best best for the nation. So Jonathan knew someone was coming, chosen of God, to replace his father. And it wasn't going to be him. The kingdom was rent from Saul and given to a neighbor. Right? Not his son. A neighbor. And 
I'm pretty sure that at this point in chapter 18, St. Jonathan knew it was David. Who better? He displays no jealousy. He just gives all of his things. And he says to David, you're going to be the next king. I know that. He's going to later say to him, my father knows it too. And so we have in Saul and Jonathan really the two ways we can react to situations. One, Jonathan is selfless. Saul, we're going to see next time we, in our next class, is eaten up with jealousy and envy and, and is completely selfish. So Jonathan, Jonathan graciously gives up his own position here and what he does in chapter 18, verses 3 and 4. And he had actually more to lose than Saul. Saul was going to get to live out his days. He wasn't going to, the kingdom wasn't going to take, be taken from him right then and there. He was able to live out his days and his kingship. And yet he was the one who was reacting negatively, whereas Jonathan was acting totally out of self-sacrifice and love for David. This is true friendship. It's, it's true love and it's true friendship. And we need to understand that. Um, there's three people um, for whom it says they love David specifically. And they're all related. In chapter 16, this is when... Um, David is, is chosen, this, this is prior to the Goliath incident, he's chosen because he can play well with the harp, and the evil spirit which came upon Saul, the, 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 the depression, the, the anxiety, was relieved by David's playing. And in, in chapter 16, verse 21, it says, so David came to Saul and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. So, there you go, Saul loved David. But it was, it was a love that was focused really on, on Saul. <clears throat> he he loved David for what David could do for him. He could relieve him of this of this uh, depression, this evil spirit, this anxiety. Um, he that's why he he wanted David for himself. It was all it was all selfish. Uh, in chapter eighteen, flip over the page after this great um, ceremony and celebration of of David's defeat of Goliath. It says Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul the thing pleased him. Well, Michael's uh, attraction to David was probably physical. It was, again, probably selfish. She saw herself taking on this mighty warrior, someone who's going to be famous in her father's domain. Um, they both loved David. But neither of those relationships last. And, and, and when it really came to it, to, to some strife and some difficulty, uh, that love soon turned to, to hate. But what about Jonathan? That's the one we're looking at today. What, what kind of love did we, he have? It says that Jonathan loved him, and, and he loved him as his own soul. It was so much deeper. It was, there was a spiritual element to this. There was something in it that bound them together. And it was because God was at the center of their relationship. So which one of these loves endured? It was the one that was based on, on, on the spiritual things, the, 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 the faith the trust, the belief that God was able to accomplish great things through them and that it was for God's glory and honor, not self. This is what attracted Jonathan to David and David to Jonathan. And this is what made their friendship enduring, not only in this life, but in the life to come. So we can ask ourselves, you know, what kind of friend are you? What kind of friend am I? Well, what's our, what is our friendships? What are our friendships based on? Well, we can simply put it this way. If you are in any relationship, and again, it could be a, a, a friend um, who is a peer, um, who, who is of the same gender in a friendship. It could be a, a friendship uh, like a boyfriend-girlfriend in a dating relationship or a courtship relationship. It could be a relationship as a parent um, or as a son or a daughter. It could be just a neighbor it could be a work colleague. Uh, it could be a spouse. If you are in any relationship whatsoever, strictly for what you can get out of it, the chances are that relationship would be short-lived, fruitless, and will likely end bitterly unless you change. And there's always the opportunity to change. And that's what we hope to, to, to see in our session today, that we can be more like Jonathan. What can I give in this relationship? What can I do to nurture this relationship? And strengthen it spiritually. How, how can I bring God into this relationship? Those are the relationships that will be meaningful and lasting. 
If you give freely of yourself, you will find it's more blessed to give than to receive. That was the teaching of the Lord, we learn in, in Acts 20, verse 35. It, it's counterintuitive. Our nature is screaming out like, what's in this for me? What can I get out of this? Um, you know, what have you done for me lately? It's all me, me, me. That, that's kind of natural. But Jesus says, go the extra mile, turn the other cheek. Uh, look for ways to give of yourselves. Look at his own, his own example, washing the disciples' feet, giving his life for the benefit of others. If we do those things, what comes back to us in this life and the life to come will far exceed that. We'll learn it's more blessed. We'll be happier when we give of ourselves than when it's just take, take, take. And we 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 often hear about the friendship of David and Jonathan and we often mention it that way, the friendship of David and Jonathan. And David comes first, and David is obviously the, the, the more significant character uh, in Scripture. You know, he, he's the, the greatest king of, of Israel. He, he's he's the, the ancestor of, of, of Jesus himself. But what I want you to note here is really we should be saying Jonathan and David. It's not two-way all the time. And we don't have time to read through the, these, these passages in, in great detail. But my suggestion would be, sit down and read through the life of David. And in particular, when, when he and Jonathan are mentioned, it's Jonathan that's taking the initiative to forge that friendship, to nurture it, to see it through to the end. He's the one who came to David and gave him all this stuff. It's, it's, he's initiating it. He's, he's keeping it going. He's nurturing the friendship. Jonathan is. And so we ask ourselves, you know, what am I doing in my friend relationships? All those relationships that I have in my life. What am I doing to nurture those relationships? To, to make them better? To make them more God-focused? Am I really giving of myself? Or am I taking? That, that's a really powerful question each of us, each of us needs to ask ourselves. I would suggest to you that this friendship, Jonathan and David, is primarily because of Jonathan. He's the one that has made this um, really uh, uh, a gold standard of what friendship should be. It's because of Jonathan's involvement and desire. All right, so let's let's keep going in the story then. Uh, we know that soon uh, the the things turn poorly. Um, basically after the right after the thing with Goliath because as they came back of course the the, the women are praising you know David has slain his thousands and uh sorry Saul has slain his thousands and David is ten thousands and and jealousy starts to creep in the relationship was never based on anything more than what Saul could get out of it and when he saw David as a, as a threat things turned sour uh so chapter 18 verse 29 David was afraid sorry Saul was afraid of David, and Saul became David's enemy continually. We'll look at this in our next class. But how does this impact uh, Jonathan? Well, in chapter uh, 19, verse 1, Saul spake to Jonathan, his son, and to all the servants that they should kill David. I mean, that was Saul's solution to the problem. This, this, this relationship had turned sour. Um, Saul didn't like David anymore, so let's just kill him. Let's, let's get rid of the problem. Look at Jonathan. This is, and remember, we already said that, that Jonathan respected his dad to a certain extent. He, he, he honored his father. But this friendship was more important to him because it was based on truth and it was based on godly principles. So chapter 19, verse 2, Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David. And Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Now, therefore, I pray you, take heed to yourself until the morning and abide in a secret place and hide thyself. And I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where thou art. And I will com commune with my father of thee. And what I see, I will tell you. So he warns his friend. You know, there's my dad. He's, he's struggling with this thing right now. So let's just see how this all plays out. This would not have been easy to do. Jonathan loved and respected his father, too. And I've got here, do you need proof of how much Jonathan loved and respected his father? Well, he died with him. And he didn't run away. He stood by his father's side while the Philistines cut him down. Okay? But he put God above his family. So when his father gives this command to kill David, Jonathan's first reaction is, i got to intervene here. i got to try and do something right. 
So verse four and five, um, he has the courage to face his father on behalf of his friend. And he actually has a positive influence. Let's keep reading here in chapter 19. Verse four, Jonathan spake good of David unto Saul, his father, and said unto him, let not the king sin, sin against his servant, against David. He has not sinned against thee. And because he, the, his works have been to thee, were very good. For he did put his hand, life in his hand and slew the Philistine. And the Lord wrought with a great salvation for all Israel. Same language that the people said of, of, of Saul in chapter 14, of, of Jonathan in chapter 14. He's wrought with the Lord. Remember that? These are kindred spirits, Jonathan and David. This is what's binding them together. Not their age, not their social status, not their um, upbringing, not their family life. What binds them together is their trust and faith and belief in God. You saw it and you were glad, you rejoiced. You remember? Remember how you felt, Dad, after the defeat of, the, of Goliath? Remember how you felt? Let's get back to that. Remember how you felt about David when he when he played his harp and, and, and ministered to you? Get back to that, Father. Don't, don't shed innocent blood and slay David without a cause. This is amazing. This is what friends do. They stand up for each other. Not when it's convenient, when it's inconvenient. And in, in, in positions where it's awkward, this is what friends do. And, and notice that Jonathan makes the appeal based on David's character. He doesn't say, oh, dad, come on. David's my friend. Can you do this for me? You know, you love me, dad. Do this for me. He doesn't. He, he bases it on, on fact on David's character, on, on David's um, connection to God, and that God works through him. Can you imagine David listening to these words? David's off to the side here. John, uh, Saul doesn't know he's there, and he's, he's hearing. What, what do we say to encourage our friends in the truth? And, and peace is restored for a while. And we know Saul loses the plot. But for now, verse 6 and 7, Saul hearkened to the voice of Jonathan, his son, and, and David is brought back, and, and peace is restored. Um, it really is incredible. Um, <clears throat> we know things go poorly, and Jonathan and David have to, to make up this plan of how they can communicate with each other. Um, so over to chapter 20, and um, David has to flee. Um, he, Saul tries to kill him, and uh, David flees in verse 1. He, he, uh, he comes to Jonathan, you know, what have I done? And uh, Jonathan's, Jonathan's like, I, I don't know. I don't know why my dad's acting this way. Um, and, and they make this, they make this plan. Let's, let's just, let's just read this, um, these sections here. Um, you know, where does David go when he's in, he's in, he's struggling? Well, he, he goes to his friend. Verse one there, he, he fled from Naoth in Ramah and came before Jonathan and said, what have I done? What's my iniquity? And what is my sin before thy father that he seeks my life? So it's, things have gone poorly again. And he said, no, I, by no means, this is Jonathan, you, you will not die. Behold, my father will do nothing, either great or small, that he will show it to me. That's the kind of relationship he had. Jonathan was able to maintain this relationship with his father and with his friend. He does his best in both those situations now. Jonathan's going to get cut out of the circle from his father's perspective, right? That's what David says here. David said, your father certainly knoweth that I have found grace in your eyes. And he said, let not Jonathan know lest he be grieved. So, so Jonathan's not in on the, the, the latest kind of plotting here. Okay, but he's, he's maintaining these relationships as best he can. This is Jonathan, amazing, amazing character. Um, but, and David David says in verse end of verse three there, as thy soul lives, there's but a step between me and death and and look at um look at what jonathan says verse four jonathan said to david whatsoever thy soul desires i will even do it unto thee now, i'm not sure what a translation of the, my, my bible uh, in the margin says say what is in thy mind and i will do it he listens we want an example of how to be a good friend how to be a Jonathan kind of friend? Here's an example. Someone comes to you and they're in strife. They're in, they're, they're, they're in difficulty. Don't launch into all your solutions. Well, if you did this and this and this and this, and I can do this. And... No, just listen. Just listen. Jonathan completely submits to David's plan. He listened first and then added his own advice. After listening, 
and da taking da David's concern seriously. Initially, he's like, no, 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 David, my dad's not going to do anything. I, I would know. I would know. David says, no, Jonathan, it's being kept from you because your father knows that you uh, have a, a strong relationship with me. So he's not telling you, but I know, I know I'm going to die. Your father's going to try and kill me. And Jonathan's like, okay, I'll listen. I'll shut up now and just listen. You tell me. And um, <clears throat> this is what David says. <clears throat> David said to, to Jonathan, behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I, and I should not fail to sit at the king's, king's table. But let me go that I may hide myself in the field under the third day. If your father at all miss me, then say, David earnestly asked me, a leave of me that he might run to Bethlehem, his city, for there is a yearly sacrifice for all the family. If he say thus, it is well, thy servant shall have peace. But if he is very wroth, then be sure that evil is determined by him. Therefore thou shalt deal kindly with thy servant, for thou hast brought thy servant into a covenant of the Lord with thee, notwithstanding, if there be any iniquity, slay me thyself, for why should thou bring me to my, my father? Now think about this. This is, his, this is David's plan. It's going to require Jonathan to be a bit disingenuous. He's going to have to play along with it and say that he gave leave of David to go to Bethlehem, which really didn't happen. He's, he's going to put himself in a really difficult situation with his dad. This is what David is asking Jonathan to do. And Jonathan does it. It's, it's really incredible. Um, Jonathan responds, well, I'm not going to kill you. That's for sure. And I don't think my dad will, but we'll, but we'll do this. Let's, let's make this plan. And they make another covenant and um, they, they make this plan that we'll go into the, into the field after I find out what goes on with my father. Um, then, you know, I'll tell you and I'll shoot the arrow. And if it goes a long way, I'll tell a young boy to run and get it. It's time to go. And you'll know you need to flee. If I say to him, oh, come, come back, it's bring the arrows to me, we'll know it's okay. And so they make this plan. And really, the the, the key part of this plan um, is there in, um, in verse uh, 23, when he says, the Lord be between me and thee forever. This was the key. God was between them in their relationship. There was no rivalry between them, because God was at the center of their relationship. Um, and you have that amazing passage in, in Ecclesi Ecclesiastes chapter 4 about, you know, two being better than one because one can lift the other up one falls um, but a threefold cord is not quickly broken and that threefold cord in whatever relationship is god in all relationships we need to intertwine god in our relationships and a threefold cord will not be soon broken <clears throat> and so unfortunately they had to depart and despite the fact that it caused strain in Jonathan's own house, he put others' needs above his own. He went along with, with David's plan here, and, uh, and he did so to, to fight, despite the fact that it was going to be a very difficult time for him with his father, and he was going to have to um, see the wrath of his father upon himself. And we find out that's exactly what happened. And we'll just pick up the story in, uh, in verse uh, 30. Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said, Thou son of a perverse and rebellious woman, do I not know that thou hast chosen the son of Jesse to thine own confusion and the confusion of thy mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives upon the ground, thou shalt not be established, nor thy kingdom. See, for Saul, it was all personal. It was all about him. And again, Saul had the kingdom. He was, where he was saying, well, you won't get the kingdom, Jonathan. And Jonathan's like, I don't want the kingdom. It's for David. He's the man after God's own heart. You've been told that, Father. This is going through his mind. Jonathan's not feeling this, this, this jealousy and this envy and this anger that his father's uh, feeling. He, he's, he's of a different spirit. And um, go and, and fetch him that he shall die. And, and look, Jonathan. Jonathan answered to his father and said, Wherefore shall he be slain? What has he done? He appeals for his friend. And Jonathan, in his sorry, Saul, Saul in his in his rage, throws a javelin at his own son. Saul cast a javelin at him to smite him, whereby Jonathan knew that it was determined by of his father to slay David. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and ate no meat on the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David because his father had done him shame. Is, is this? Is this incredible? He's just had a javelin thrown at him. And he's angry because what his father said about his friend David. 
not about what was happen, about to happen to him. He had just dodged a javelin, thrown it in by his father, and he's thinking about David. And he's thinking of the shame that his father brought upon David. That's, that's where his mind is. That's what true friends do. They think about the needs of others. They put others' needs above their own. And so they met here this one last time with the arrow. He shot the arrow beyond and told the young lad to go get them and take them back into the city. But they were safe. Um, verse 41, as soon as the lad had, was gone, David arose out of the place to the south and fell on his face and bowed himself three times. And they kissed one another and wept one with another until David exceeded. David understands what Jonathan has done and he, he does him honor. He, he, he bows down in front of him. This is, you know, David's been anointed king. He's not king yet, but he's been anointed. And Jonathan knows it and David knows it. In verse 42, Jonathan said to David, go in peace. For as much as we have sworn, sworn both of us in the name of the Lord, saying, the Lord be between me and thee and between my seed and thy seed after thee forever. And he rose and departed and Jonathan went into the city. This may have been their last meeting. They don't know they're going to get another chance to meet. And 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 just the, the incredible um, faith uh, in, in, in each other and in God and their trust. Uh, that they would do anything for each other, literally. And, and Jonathan here shows it, that he would be willing to take one for his friend. And, and he, he showed that. So the, the story progresses, and, and we'll be spending more time in this when we look at, at, uh, at Saul. Um, but in chapter uh, 23, Jonathan seeks out his friend and finds him. And this is quite remarkable. Uh, it's chapter 23, verse 16. It just simply says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the wood and strengthened his hand in God. Now, just think about that for a minute. If you cast your eyes over the previous uh, verses and chapters, Saul has been hunting for David. He's been sending men out for David. He's been besieging cities to try and trap David. But he can't seem to find him anywhere. But Jonathan, in this amazing way, has been able to find his friend right away. And he doesn't jeopardize him. He's not revealing his position, although he obviously knows. He's not going to tell his father. Do you see what he's doing? He's, he's maintaining these two relationships that are really at, at total opposites. And what happens here? If you want to know, if you want to kind of be highlighted, the, the greatness of Jonathan, if you haven't already been impressed, it's Jonathan, Saul's son, who's strengthening David's hand in God. Do we do that in, in our relationships, in our friendships, in our whatever relationships that we're in? Do we strengthen the other person's hand in God by the things that we say and the things that we do? And this is what he said. This is Jonathan speaking to David. Do not fear, for the hand of Saul, my father, shall not find you. How can he how can he say that? Because he believes in God. I mean, he's, he's obviously doing what he can himself to keep uh, David's position secret. But it's because of his trust in God. Because look what he says next. You will be king over Israel. How does, John, how does Jonathan know that? The Samuel, the prophet said it. God said it. David was going to be the next king. This didn't, didn't uh, arouse jealousy or envy in Jonathan. He loved David for it because he knew he was a man after God's own heart. Yeah, it's hard to read the next line without really just breaking down in tears. Jonathan says to David, you're going to be the next king over Israel and I'll be next to you. And he says, even my father Saul knows that. This was Jonathan's hope that he would be David's helper. What can I do to help you in the kingdom? I'm going to help you now in exile, running from my father. I know you're going to be king. And I'll be there right beside you. Now, that didn't work out. It wasn't to be God's plan. God in his wisdom knew that that wasn't going to be best for either of them. And, and, and so Saul and Jonathan die together in battle. And Jonathan doesn't get to see David made king. But they will be together in God's kingdom on earth when Jesus returns. And they will rule together. There's no doubt about that. So the two of them made a covenant before the Lord. And David stayed in the woods and Jonathan went. To his own house and as far as we know they they didn't see each other any time after that 
So friendship in the truth is, is vital. Friendship with, with fellow believers. Three times they made a covenant, and they're there on the screen. 1 Samuel 18 and 3, 20 and 16, 23 and 18. And, and just a few verses that come to mind. We don't need to turn these up. Proverbs 27, 17. As iron sharpening iron, so sharpens a man the countenance of his friend. Remember, these these weren't this wasn't a natural friendship. They didn't grow up in the same house. They didn't come from the same background. They weren't the same age. But they they helped each other. They were bound together. God was at the center of their life. Uh, Proverbs, uh, sorry, um, Hebrews uh, ten, verse twenty four to twenty five. What's in it for us? We're to provoke to love and to good works. That's why we meet together. That's why we need friendship in the truth. We need to meet with fellow believers, and and sharpen each other. Help each other. And of course, 1 Thessalonians 15, 11, edify one another. The word edify is to build up. Build each other up. What are, what are you doing in your relationships? Are you tearing down? Are you, um, you know, filled with envy? And, and, and is there a conflict? We need to build each other up. We need to provoke to love and to good works. We need to sharpen each other. With God's word and God's promises, David, it's going to be all right. I know it doesn't look like that right now. My father's hunting you down. He's, he's trying to kill you, but, but God has plans for you. It's going to be all right. I, I believe God's word. I, I trust God. And so we come to the end. And we know that uh, Jonathan dies on a hilltop, a barren hilltop. The Philistine, Philistines kill him. He's there. He's beside his father. He dies with his father. And, and David is, is overcome. And uh, there's this this well known passage at the end of his song, really, that he that he sings that he, he he says, "I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan, for you have been very pleasant to me. Your love was wonderful, surpassing the love of women." First, Second Samuel one twenty six. What does that mean? It's because it wasn't just a physical love. There, there was it wasn't natural. It was it was a spiritual love. There, there was something intangible. He couldn't even express it as he's, he's sobbing and weeping. And it was that relationship that he had with Jonathan that was based and founded on God's promises, on God's word, on faith and trust <clears throat> that God can work out in any situation. He can deliver with many or few. Um, he will deliver me from the hand of this giant. He'll be with you, David, through all your, your circumstances. This was what bound them together. This was the love that, that made their relationship work. And so in summary, <clears throat> David and Jonathan had an intense friendship, even though they weren't, they were not together all that much. When you read through this, we just skipped like 10 chapters. We don't hear about it. Their, 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 their lives are punctuated with, with, with times when they get to be together. But, but the truth, faith, belief, trust in God, compensates for all these physical barriers such as time or distance or age any of these things friendship and the truth transcends all that and david and jonathan didn't spend heaps of time together in terms of quantity but the quality of their time the the, the depth of their relationship founded upon the things of god they were often separated jonathan had to go looking for him in the wood they, they weren't able to hang out because of Saul, but that didn't matter. They weren't the same age. They weren't peer, they weren't in the same peer group. That didn't matter. This intense friendship founded upon the things of God transcended all those natural physical barriers. And of course, God was the third partner. He was at the center of their relationship to make that unbreakable threefold cord. That was the key. And so as we draw to a close this for our first session on David's friends and foes, looking at this intense friendship and relationship between uh, David and Jonathan, or should I say Jonathan and David, Jonathan being the prime mover in this relationship. We can ask ourselves, are we friends like Jonathan was friend, a friend to David? How can we be that kind of friend? Don't go looking for friends for what they can do for us. Ask yourself, what can I do in these relationships to be a friend, to act like a friend, to be like Jonathan? 
So next week we'll be looking at Saul. It's going to be a nice um, counterbalance to this one. Everything we've learned about Jonathan as a friendship, we're going to see the opposite in, in Saul as a foe of David. And we'll, we'll meet Jonathan again in the person of his son. And down, down the track, when we look at how David reacts to this covenant they made. Remember, the covenant was between them and between their children. And David's going to honor that when he reaches out to Mephibosheth, uh, the, the, the son of Jonathan. And so that's just the beginning. Hopefully that's uh, given you some different insights as we've explored the Bible together, read it effectively by turning the angle lens and, and looking at David through the eyes of Jonathan. I hope that's been helpful to you. And, and I pray that God will be with you in your study of his word. Um, and as you learn to read it effectively and, and to explore the, the explore and find the treasures hidden in it. And, and so until next time, take care and God be with you as you read your word, read his word and, and study it and, and try to develop and transform your own character in accordance to those principles that God has laid out in his word in the examples, many examples that we read like David and like his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But in particular this week, as we've looked at that wonderful example of God's servant and faithful one, Jonathan.